people judge us by the skin we're in. They judge us by how light or dark we are, how tall or short we are, how fat or skinny we are, how you know, much we match their image of what beautiful should be or isn't. And it makes us feel bad. Most of us, everybody, responds to it like, oh, I'm different. I'm different from the others. I don't look like them. I don't act like them. And we spend a lot of time apologizing or, or trying to get in line behind where they're at. But the skin we're in protects a very valuable treasure. And the treasure that it protects is your uniqueness, that which is inside of you. Often people say, oh man, I'm different, man. They, they make fun of me because I'm weird, man. You know, like I'm weird, like I'm not like the others. Like, you know, they make fun of me. And others say, yeah, yeah, she's right, she's weird. She's different, she's not like us. And what I try and get people to understand is that being different itself already gives you value, already makes you special. It gives you something powerful that is who you really are, born to be absolutely unique and different. So being weird is not a bad thing, but we put these labels on people. We stick them on as if they were a piece of clothing or, or a little sign on the forehead that says weird, different, short, flaca, whatever. Whatever labels they stick on us, and then we start to believe them. So. I would hope that what we start to do is to recognize the skin we're in and to love it. And to recognize, even more importantly, what's inside the skin that we're in. So I'm going to share with you a few poems. Some of them go back a long ways in San Antonio history because San Antonio has a long, long history. And I get frustrated with our history textbooks. Our history textbooks don't always tell us what was here before. If you happen to live in Texas, like we do, all of a sudden they start talking about, oh yes, Texas history begins with the Battle of the Alamo. Or they might get real innovative and go a whole 10 years before that and say, the first baby born in Texas was so-and-so Jones in 1820 something. And you're like, excuse me, where do you think all those people that were here came from? And were they not babies? Did they hatch from eggs or something? Because we have been here for a long while. The Alamo is only in the modern part of our history. So I like to take people way back, way, way back to understand that the city has been here since before it was even called San Antonio. It was here when there were indigenous peoples here who had been here for thousands of years. I'm going to share with you um, a poem that talks a little bit about that river that goes right through the middle of San Antonio. Um, or maybe it's not about that river. Maybe it's about the Blanco River that goes right through San Marcos and Wimberley. Or maybe it's not that river. Maybe it's about the Medina River south of town. Or maybe it's about some other river. Or maybe it's about all the rivers that end up flowing together just like we as human beings are separate, but eventually we all impact each other in one big flow. This is called this river here, and you can take it to mean any river you love. This river here is full of me and mine. This river here is full of you and yours, right here, or maybe a little farther down. My great-grandmother washed the dirt out of her family's clothes, soaking them, scrubbing them, bringing them up clean. Right here, or maybe a little farther down, my grandpa washed the sins out of his congregation's souls, baptizing them, scrubbing them, bringing them up clean. Right here, or maybe a little farther down. My great-great-grandma froze with fear as she glimpsed between the lean, dark trees, a lean, dark Indian peering at her. She ran home screaming, ay, los indios, ay, vienen los indios, as he threw pebbles at her, laughing, till one day she got mad and stayed and threw pebbles right back at him. After they got married, they built their house right here, or maybe a little farther down. Right here, my father gathered mesquite beans and wild berries, working with a passion during the Depression. His eager sweat poured off and mixed so easily with the water of this river here. Right here, 
My mother cried in silence so far from her home, sitting with her one brown suitcase and rolling tears of loneliness and longing, which mixed again so easily with the currents of this river here. Right here, we'd pour out picnics and childhood's blood from dirty scrapes on dirty knees and every generation's first-hand stories of the weeping lady, La Llorona, haunting the river every night, crying, Ay, mis hijos. It happened right here. The fear dripped off our skin and the blood dripped off our scrapes and they mixed with the river water right here. Right here, the stories and the stillness of those gone before us haunt us still, now grown, our scrapes in different places, the voices of those now dead, quieter, but not too far away. Right here, we were married, you and I, and the music filled the air, danced in, dipped in, mixed in with the river water, dirt and sins, fear and anger, sweat and tears, love and music, blood and memories. It was right here, and right here we stand, washing clean our memories, baptizing our hearts, gathering past and present, dancing to the flow we find right here, or maybe a little farther down. And it's a little bit about San Antonio's history. It's a little bit about our history as human beings and how so much goes into making what we are right now. But there's still people out there who are thinking, even when I say, oh, you are so special, you have so much to give, and they go, no, hombre, not me, ma'am, you don't know. She's smart, he's talented, she's creative. You don't know, ma'am, you don't understand. We're like nothing, I mean, like, I'm not nothing, I'm like plain, you know? Like my family, they're not special, like they don't do nothing. Like when you say, what did you do on your summer vacation? Like we didn't do nothing, like we don't go nowhere, like we don't go to Disneyland, like we don't do that kind of stuff, like, which is not special, ma'am, you don't understand. I'm just not, you're talking about somebody else, you're not talking about me. How many of you have ever felt that at some point when people are saying, oh, you are all the future leaders? And you're going, yeah, right, you know? Because what happens is in societies where labels count so much and skin is such a big indicator of who looks like a success and who doesn't look like a success, where decisions about whether a person's a criminal or a promising clean-cut kid are often judged by color, or by features, or by age. Those kinds of things sometimes make us limit what we think our own potential is. I'm not special. I'm not special. I'm going to read you a poem about a young girl. It's in Tex-Mex. Is that OK with everybody? It's between English and Spanish. Actually, what I did, I made a. Uh, English version and a Spanish version. They're both mixed between English and Spanish. But the English version has more English with Spanish sprinkled in, and the Spanish version has more Spanish with English sprinkled in. Because I grew up right here in San Antonio mixing English and Spanish. It was my native language. You know, the, the realities of our culture are that we take the best from both. We pick from what we see and we blend it together. And I would say, Mama, me caí de mi bike. I hurt my knee. Salió mucho blood. You know, and mix the Spanish and English together like that. And so this poem, I'll read you the English version, but it's got a lot of Spanish in it. Okay, everybody tolerate that? La Miss Low. And I guess what I want you to think about is the fact that this teacher that the young child is looking at has put herself, and the system maybe has put her, at a whole different level of importance. And has put the students down here, like they don't count. She counts. She's civilized. They're just a bunch of chamacos. They're a bunch of kids that don't know nothing. And this child has something which she could offer, but because she's a teacher, she's a student, it doesn't happen. Let me slow. La Miss Low was tall and thin and wore her short, pale hair tight around her small head like the skin of a pea. La Rosary, she always wanted to style her hair so she'd look pretty. But since she was a teacher and we were just kids, La Rosary 
told her nothing. La Miss Lowe would stand close to Mr. Mason, thinking, we think, to look more elegant by standing next to a man, even if he was married and with his crew cut that only he thought made him look cool. But when he turned his head to talk to her, to address a few words to her between classes in the noisy halls, it was just them, the two of them, hero and heroine, between all of us kids. And she would feel mature, elegant, intimate, laughing slowly and so politely at anything with him. La Miss Lowe didn't talk much, tried to raise her chin like a noble figure to let her silence, guardian of the princess, speak for her, speak complex, sensitive things, to hold her face expressionless, revealing the nobility of her soul, to model a high example for these uncultured children. La Rosary said, that if she could style her hair full and soft, letting it grow a little longer, putting in a few curls, putting more color in her makeup, teaching her to let herself go, to be more natural, that she could make her look bien pretty. La Miss Lowe was tall and thin and stood like a statue of civilization amid chaos, while La Rosary saw her like fertile ground, awaiting the planting with rosary wanting to cultivate with tender care her garden. Did you get la number seven? I'd ask her. And she would open her book with a long sigh, saying, I could make her look bien pretty. But since she was a teacher and we were just kids, la rosary told her nothing. How often do we not know what people have inside of them, inside that skin, that they could offer, that they could give to the world? How often do you or does someone else limit you because you don't look like you have anything to offer? And all of us have something to offer, something tremendous and something unique. Uh, I like to write about the kinds of things that show the people that we take for granted as having a lot of talent and having a lot of perspective. And often it's about students because students come under the definition of needing to learn something from somebody else. And we all need to learn something from somebody else. But sometimes those somebody else's need to learn something from us as well. Those people need to learn to listen to us, to understand how much we have to give, to hear our thoughts, and to get ideas from those thoughts, and to help make it a worldwide solution to the problems that we have. And so, one of the little pieces that I, that I wrote many, many years ago, it's in the book that was banned in Arizona, um, Curandera. It's a little tiny piece of what, at that time, we didn't even have the name for it. Um, now they call it flash fiction. And it means a piece of prose so short and so compact that it bears the same power of poetry. It says a lot in a very few words. I also like to use a lot of dramatic monologue. I like to let the characters speak for themselves. I think the lines are more powerful when they come from people. And so this is the discussion, with, with very little aside, it's a dialogue between a college professor and a young college kid who sits in the back row, who isn't really paid much attention to, but who has something really important to say to the professor. It comes from a time period when Chicano literature, literature that described the Mexican-American experience and our history, um, just wasn't available in the schools. It wasn't available in the standard bookstores. It was rarely found. It was just beginning to be published. And often English teachers, both college and high school, would say to us, you can't read that stuff. There's nothing there that's really quality. You know, if you want something really serious, read Shakespeare. You know, maybe read Faulkner. Maybe, maybe you could read Victor Hugo. No, he's from France, and they have very important writers that come from France. And they wouldn't see that we have very important literature that came from our experience right here, right here in San Antonio or in other parts of the world. So the minority voice often gets kind of pushed out. 
And this is a little interaction between a college prof and a student. And the little piece of flash fiction is called quality literature. Dr. Dumont said a quiet voice from the back row of the world lit class as the bell rang and the distinguished professor gathered his papers to dash from the room. Yes, said Dumont in his crisp pseudo-British accent as a hazy face with a name he didn't remember approached him. You said the other day that uh, we could write a critique thing on any author just to get it approved by you first. And well, I was in the library the other day and they got this real good book by Elena Martinez called La Tierra Grita and I want to do mine on that. Elena Martinez, I don't recall the name. Is she the poetess from Chile? No, sir. She's a Chicana. It's about a campesino family and it's Chicano literature. No, I'm afraid I just can't approve that. Read it if you wish. But for your report, we need quality literature. And Chicano literature simply isn't quality. But this stuff's good, sir. I mean, it's the first stuff I ever seen that really talks about real things. There's writers like Toribio Salinas, and have you read Juan Rivera, sir? No, but why don't you look into Samuel Beckett's Sonaton Don Godot? The French existentialist theater is really superb in its handling of the alienation of the individual in society. The profundity and subtlety in its absurd context magnify the impact of its universal reality. It speaks to the commonest of situations, and yet elevates to the philosophically sublime, the lowest of human positions. I would think it would be an excellent topic for you. But have you read Inés de Leon, sir? No, but I really think Beckett's French existentialist theatre would provide an almost unlimited opportunity for development and commentary. There's some books that might interest you on it. There's one by Fontaine on the peculiar juxtaposition of characters in Godot, and there's quite a few references available on the manneristic existentialism evident in his theatre. I'm certain our library would have quite a good bit on it. And Well, how about Frank Sanchez, sir? Have you read him? No, but there simply hasn't been any quality Chicano literature. If you must have something in Spanish, try Dorio or Borges or Cervantes. Dorio has been highly acclaimed in Madrid and even Paris, said the professor, examining with slight curiosity the face of the student we now faintly recalled as having made very poor marks on the last exam. Of course, he thought. Soledad Cantú has been published in Spain. Could I write on her, sir? Dumont continued to shake his head, gathered his papers under his arm, leaned into the face of the student, and stated emphatically, but it hasn't even been critiqued in the PMLA, the Journal of the Modern Language Association, and until it's critiqued in the PMLA, I can't say it's quality literature. And the professor walked off into a semicolon as the face of the student became an epic poem. I'd love to say this was really, really fiction, but the truth is that it's based on stuff that really happened. It's based on interactions between people who couldn't see inside somebody else's skin, couldn't appreciate what other experiences, what other cultures might be there in the world other than the ones that they learned. And the worst thing is that Dr. Dumont doesn't even use his own brain to judge whether something's quality or not. He has to turn to what his holy Bible is, the PMLA, to tell him whether it's quality or not. So of those two, who's being the better scholar? Is it the young student or is it the college prof who isn't even thinking, isn't even reading all this new literature that's coming out? I thought when, when I first heard that the book was banned, <laughs> I thought, oh, wow, okay, what did I do to offend them? So I picked it up, got it off the shelf. I hadn't I'd written it 30 years ago. So I picked it up and I started to look through it and say, what? I read it from front cover to back. And I thought, you know what? I know why they banned this. They didn't ban it because it was offensive. They banned it because they never read it. They banned it because it was on the list of Mexican-American studies curriculum. And they decided, bound to be anti-patriotic. And I don't think that people appreciating their land or their culture or their family or their own personal value in history is unpatriotic. I think it makes a more powerful, exciting nation. Um, so I like people to look back, to examine, to try and, and 
find out what it is that, that they have to offer. There's, a, there's another poem in the same book that describes some of what happens when we start disconnecting from the culture of the students. I grew up in a San Antonio that was very different from what it is today. There was still good Mexican food here, and there were still lots of Mexican-Americans, and there were lots of uh, people who appreciated our unique blend of cultures, but there wasn't as much public acceptance of our status or our value as a culture. And it wasn't just our culture, it was a lot of cultures that were excluded. Things were very white and male at the top. And we hadn't even at that point ever had a Mexican-American woman be a city council person. We had not in a hundred years had a Mexican-American as mayor. And the school that I attended right here in this city frisked the kids going in and out of the cafeteria. Now, it may seem strange to you today, but since I was a little kid, and this was all I knew, I thought everybody got frisked in every middle school. I thought this is what you do when you go to middle school, right? The boys go in one line, and the girls go in another. And the boys were spread eagles, and they were frisked before they went into the cafeteria, and when they came out of the cafeteria. And the girls, had to stop and be checked to make sure they didn't have teased hair and they had to have their purses checked. Make sure we didn't have any contraband material like mirrors, perfume bottles, or deodorant bottles. Now, we had PE during the day, right? So a lot of people like to carry certain items with them in their purses, but we had to line up, get our purses checked. So being a curious sort, I said to the teacher once, ma'am, how come we can't have tis hair? She says, because if you get into a fight, you're going to reach into your hair, pull out the knife, and stab somebody with it. Oh, okay. Ma'am, how come we can't have mirrors or perfume bottles? Oh, because if you get into a fight, you're going to reach into your purse, pull out that mirror, break it, and slash somebody with it. And we said, Oh, so we learned a lot when we were in junior high. But it wasn't what they were expecting us to learn. We learned what the stereotype was of us. And some of us believed it. Some of those guys got frisked so much, they ended up in jail. Because it looked comfortable. Yeah, this is what I'm supposed to be. They had these expectations of me all through school. So when I got my doctorate, my PhD, which is kind of the end of a line in education. Yeah, you can go get, do postdoctoral studies, but you can't go get another degree after a doctor unless you go get another PhD or decide to go back and start over and add some more lower degrees. It's the highest you can go in most fields. So I had gotten my high school diploma. My parents said, <laughs> get an education. Then I took them a little too seriously. You know, they said, oh, que bueno. And she's going to college. And then I got my bachelor's. Ah, que bueno, are you coming home? I said, no, I'm going to get my master's. Ah. And they used to think I was smart, but after all, the people in the family said, todavía está en la escuela. She still hasn't gotten out of school. We used to think she was smart, but she's still in school. And then I went back and I got my doctorate. And at that point, kind of looking back at the road I had taken to get to the doctorate, it struck me as so sad that the expectations of us in the school had let so many people not reach their potential. Part of it was the color of the skin. They could look at me and say, yeah, she looks like she's a smart kid. And they could look to my best friend Liz right next to me. And when Liz would turn in a really good paper, they'd say, did you copy from her? Did you copy from her? because they couldn't believe that a dark-skinned person was smart. And Liz was twice as smart as I was. But expectations. So you have to be strong. You have to be strong enough that when those negative expectations come at you, you grab a book and let it bounce back and keep your own high expectations of who you are. Know who you are. Feel who you are. 
I'm going to share with you this poem, not because I want you to think about a depressing period in our history, but if we don't know our history, we can repeat it. And right now, in large parts of this country, people are repeating some of the same mistakes they made before, outlawing languages, having neg negative expectations of people who look like they might be undocumented, and the expectations are hurting young people like you. So you have to be strong. You have to be leaders. I'm going to share with you this little poem that came out, like say, in reflection of, from the point of the doctorate, looking back at the point of being in the cafeteria, being frisked, and having purses checked. It's called When I Dream Dreams. When I dream dreams, I dream of you, Rhodes Junior School, and the lockers of our minds that were always jammed stuck or that always hung open and would never close. No matter how hard you tried, we messed up the looks of the place and wouldn't be neat and organized and look like we were supposed to look and lock like we were supposed to lock. Yeah, that's right. I dream of you. Degrees later and from both sides of the desk, my dreams take place in your two-way halls. Hall guards from among us, human traffic markers, bumps on the road between the lanes to say when we were supposed to say where to turn left, where right, and how to get where you were going. You never get to high school speaking Spanish, I was told. Nice of them, they thought, to not report me, breaking state law, breaking school law, speaking dirty, speaking Spanish. And our tongues couldn't lump it and do what they were supposed to do, so instead I reminded others to button buttons and tuck shirt tails in. I never graduated to a cafeteria guard who knows how they were picked? We thought it had something to do with the FBI or maybe the principal's office. So we got frisked. Boys in one line, girls in another. Twice every day, entering lunch and leaving. Check, no knives on the boys. Check, no dangerous weapons on the girls, like mirrors, perfume bottles, deodorant bottles, or teased hair. So we wandered the halls, cool chuca style, no se salen unawares, never knowing other junior highs were never frisked, never knowing what the teacher said in the teacher's lounge, never knowing we were supposed to be the toughest junior high in town. And the lockers of our minds are now assigned to other minds, carry other books, follow other rules, silence other tongues, go to other schools, schools of Vietnam, schools of cheap cafe, schools of dropout droppings, prison pains, and cop cars bulleted brains. Marcelino thought the only way to finance college was the Air Force, GI Bill, and good pay. War looked easy compared to here. Took his chances on a college education, took his pay on a shot down helicopter in a brown skinned nom with the Pledge of Allegiance in his mind he had memorized through Spanish speaking teeth. As a hall guard, he was clean cut, now cut clean down in a hospital ward, paralyzed below the lips that still speak Spanish, slowly. Silvia thought no one had the right to tell her what to do. One year out of junior high, she bitterly bore her second pregnancy, stabbed forks on the cafe tables and slushed coffee through the crowds 16 hours a day, and she was 15 and still fighting to say, I have a right to be me, and Lalo, with a mind that could write in his sleep, growing epics from eyes that could dream, now writes only the same story over and over until the day that it's all over as he's frisked and he's frisked and he's frisked and they keep finding nothing. And even when he's out, his mind is always in prison. Like Lupe's mind that peels potatoes and chops repollo and wishes its boredom was less than the ants in the hill and never learned to read because the words were in English and she was in Spanish. I wonder what we would do, Rhodes Junior School, if we had all those emblems of you stamped on our lives with a big red R like the letter sweaters we could never afford to buy. I keep my honorary junior school diploma from you right next to the BAMA, et cetera, to a PhD because it means I graduated from you. And when I dream dreams, how I wish 
my dreams had graduated too. <laughs>